I'm here with Syed Salahuddin and uh, Kanal Gupta. And uh, you guys are the founders of Baby Castles. True or false? True. OK. True. Cool. So I, I, when I was sitting down to kind of prepare this, this interview, um, I, I was kind of trying to remember the, the first time I heard about Baby Castles. And um, I kind of uncovered this, this memory. There was a, an early Game Center lecture um, back when the Game Center was just getting started, the NYU Game Center. Um, Charles Pratt was uh, hosting a panel of uh, indie game designers. And uh, on that panel was uh, Anna Anthropy, who went on to design Dysphoria. Um, Cactus, who went on to make uh, Hotline Miami. Um, Mark Essen, who went on to make uh, Nidhogg. None of these games had come out yet at that time. Um, during the Q&A time, um, there was a guy in the audience with a, with a funny accent who uh, wanted to disagree with the panelists about um, the fact that uh, they said that you couldn't really make money making Flash games. And, and he said, well, I, I, I'm in a game called Quop. <laughs> and, it was, uh, and, it was, and it was Bennett Foddy, and, and uh, he was there in the audience. And then this other, this other dude raised his hand and said, well, um, you know, I, I, I have this idea, and I kind of wanted to hear what you guys thought about it. I was thinking about open up this kind of arcade exhibition space, and we're going to have games, and uh, it's going it's, it's to launch like in a month. And uh, that was you, Canal, talking about Baby Castles. And that was the first time I'd, I'd, I'd heard about Baby Castles. Um, I don't even know if it was, it was probably called that already. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's just an interesting, that was four and a half years ago. Um, and you know, I think indie games have exploded since then. Um, and yeah, it, it was just a really interesting memory to me that, that, that kind of you guys have been at it throughout this sort of, this big uh, massive elevator ride. Um, but I mean, yeah, if, if, if you could take a step, step back maybe, and I'm not sure, how many people here are deeply familiar with or even casually familiar with Baby Castles, if you could just kind of quickly summarize like what Baby Castles is, what it, what it started out as, what it's meant to be. I think it's actually easy to pick up from that story because um, uh, Frank Lance of NYU Game Center now was uh, my grad school teacher at, at ITP. And we had a, um, with Charles Pratt, we had a conversational class where we were just trying to figure out what we can do for games. And that was really, it was called advanced game design, not, and not a single bit of it was game design. We were just, what, what could we do for games as a culture right now? And, um, and it was basically a proposal, which was, uh, let's try to get games, let's try to get people playing independent games. Let's try to get independent games to stand for the medium of games. Uh, you know, so that just the conversation was rooted in the right place, both in the public and the academic uh, conversations, anything. We just wanted uh, to bring independent work to the stage and, and kind of, uh, you know, make that percentage of the conversation a lot bigger. And the way we decided to do that was to start building a place for uh, playing these games in New York City. And it hasn't really changed that much since that, that mission. The mission is still the same, it's to get, to recognize and to celebrate uh, independent games in physical place in, in your city. And for us, it's uh, New York City. Um, and so we focus mostly on making these exhibitions or helping other groups make these exhibitions. And that's, uh, uh, to us, it's helping the art side of video games come to place. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's like uh, that whole moment brings back a lot of a lot of memories. Like um, I remember um, going to Kokoromi, which was uh, well, Kokoromi is a collective uh, going to Gamma 3D and Gamma 256, which were parties thrown by this collective in Montreal called uh, Kokoromi, um, who is Cindy Paramba, uh, Phil Fish, uh, Heather Kelly and Damien, um, they uh, would throw these parties celebrating independent games and they were really fun, exciting, there was music and I remember going there and be like, oh, it'd be amazing to do something like this in New York and build arcade cabinets. And then uh, at the time, uh, me and Kunal were going to this program at NYU called ITP and he posted something on, uh, on the board uh, inviting people to build arcade cabinets and I got really excited and um, and uh, that was the first time I introduced Kunal to Ivan Safran, who's also a video game developer here. 
And I showed up to the basement of Silent Barn to build cabinets with Canal. And um, one, of the, one of the funny moments of that was like, uh, he, he had uh, gotten suggestions for, for the first curation of like this proto Baby Castles games exhibition. And he's like, I can't find this game developer. He made this game. It's like a text adventure, and it was my game. <laughs> and so I was like, whoa, I'll help you put this up. And so uh, afterwards, we started, we started, you know, we started collaborating. And um, the names that you mentioned at that, at that panel, those are every, each and every one of those game designers are incredibly important in our history right. and have influenced the way we show in games. Um, yeah, and, and s several have kind of collaborated with you or shown their work at, at, at your events. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I, I guess there's, as, as Margaret and I were putting together the, uh, the conference, um, sort of, there, there were kind of threads and topics that we were kind of interested in, in, in pursuing, and then there were others that kind of emerged as we, as we were looking over the, the, the talks that the conference was, was made up of. And I think one of the ones that was so, sort of striking is, is this, you know, the indie game boom um, is so much an, an online phenomenon, right? Like, like it's, it, it, it started out and centered around, you know, certain forums and, and, and the uh, availability of digital distribution and, um, you know, the, the, these tools that, that are available now. But at the, at the same time, there's been this kind of, this almost reaction to that of, of people pursuing these, these ways to kind of bring stuff back out of online and, and, and into the physical world. You know, y yesterday, uh, Cecily Carver was giving a talk about um, building community. Um, the parties that you mentioned are, are definitely a big part of it. Um, Alejandro tomorrow is, is, is talking about um, making zines, which are these kind of like physical artifacts, um, specifically non-digital. You know, um, you guys, um, Baby Castles is running a, uh, a zine reading lounge here at, at Indicate East. Um, and so yeah, I, I, I found that, that really striking. Like, like, like what is it about the face-to-face -face stuff that kind of so resonated with you? What, what was so meaningful and important about that? Um, I, guess <laughs> I guess one of the, one of the coolest things that happened when we started a space was uh, uh, we had absolutely no idea that there were people who cared about games in that in that area, in, in Queens, um, at the Silent Barn. Um, when we started the space, it was kind of, uh, it, it, was, it was this idea of introducing games to the general public of, of Silent Barn or, or the general public uh, who came to shows there. Um, and we slowly discovered that, you know, people started coming to our shows and we're like, yeah, I'm a games journalist. Like Lee Alexander was like, she showed up and she like lived two blocks away. Um, uh, people who are involved in all parts of the games industry um, in various ways as independent game developers, artists, musicians, um, uh, started coming to our shows and, and, and meeting each other. And it was like really cool and really, really exciting. That took us by surprise uh, um, and it was like pretty shocking. Yeah, there's something I, I was I was thinking about this in, in the preparation for the talk. There's something almost um, counterintuitive about the way that that physical space and physical meetups work, which is that, and it's exactly what you're talking about, is that it, it captures and enables happenstance, maybe in a way that that online interactions aren't always geared toward. Right? That that, that online, so much of how we present ourselves requires intention, mm -hmm. and 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 kind of so so often online, the way that you get noticed is is this sort of like this this performative exhibitionist kind of thing that not everyone is kind of into, right? Like getting a bunch of Twitter followers or, or, or whatever. Whereas having an event, having a space is a thing where a person can show up and then you bump into them and then you have a conversation and that's just, a, it's just an alternate way to form connections and, and, and to be aware of what's going on. Um, you can do more than show up. You can, um, and this is, this is kind of the, the values we inherit from the New York ecosystem and probably DC and in America so far. And, um, but there's this DIY ethos that um, we inherited in Bushwick, but I think I had inherited from ABC No Rio and some other places uh, <coughs> that we, we grew up going to as youth. But the idea behind these places is that um, you get involved. I mean, they're made for you to show up and then sort of hang out a little too long and ask how you could help and start positioning you know, the lighting or the cabinet. Lighting, uh, writing like an article on it or um, um, curating a, a video game exhibition or something. You just start pouring some creativity uh, expression on also your 
your value system into the space. And so the community starts inhabiting these DIY spaces. And Baby Castles took that to mean a lot. Um, but I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to say this. Well, I also organized this venue called The Silent Barn in Bushwick. Um, and I've done that pretty, con like almost the same timeline as Baby Castles, but that's where Baby Castles grew up. And it grew up because we came to this venue and we had, and it was a DIY art space, and we came to them with some sort of idea, and they're like, sure, take this space and some time and, you know, invite your friends. And we did, and a few friends came out, and we did that a few times, and, you know, their friends came out. and some strangers came out, and then all these people you're talking about came out, and suddenly they started, you know, they hadn't actually met each other in person like that before in the same way, especially not with the same regularity. And so we started seeing a community. Now this community actually is what empowers these communities. To me, this is the speech I give to Silent Bar when I'm trying to get them to think about diversity and their value to their neighborhood, but these communities make the world go around. You talk, like people, like there's always money, but I mean, there's just like, I feel like the, the communities that form can't form without spaces like this, especially local communities, and they actually influence and shape the world around them. Like, baby castles wouldn't exist had not people shown up and got excited to help us to exist, and these pro the, so that project wouldn't happen. Barn for book would not happen without the thousands of people coming to make it happen, and those people wouldn't exist without the community infrastructure, which was built around the spaces they, they met each other in. So um, and start defining themselves in and and you know contributing to creatively. Um, so I, th I just thought that participatory aspect is ex is, I mean it's like open source software I guess in a sense. But you're just bringing you know that's one sphere and there's another sphere for the same kinds of principles that uh, is empowering. Yeah. So I, I mean th there were a couple of things that you both mentioned there that, that I'd like to maybe uh, spend some more time on and, and dig in on. And I I think it's about the the those roots of those DIY. Um, principles, you know, and and, and um, you know, because I, I think it's the thing that, that that the three of us shared somewhat in common in, in, in our in our pasts, um, and and things that had kind of maybe we were exposed to or, or hit us at a, at a very uh, formative age, and, and and kind of it's a principle that we carry carry forward. I mean, you mentioned ABC No Rio. I, I, I'm not sure how many people here know what that is. Um, maybe we could talk about ABC or ABC No Rio a little bit. Um, sure. Um, so ABC No Rio is a uh, is a building and a space in um, Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, they started in the late 80s. I, I went there in the, in the late 90s as a teenager um, going to DIY all ages punk shows there um, and f helping out at Food Not Bombs. Um, and they c were created as a response to the 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 culture around music, uh, around hardcore music, punk music, and uh, and capitalism in general. Um, uh, one of uh, one of their uh, main um, requirements was that we're you know we're subverting um, all these other show spaces that are just for profit. We're making a community center. Um, that has shows and then also gives back to the community. And then the other thing was that um, they were they promoted shows that were anti-sexist, anti-racist, and um, they were basically trying to to cull the machismo that was happening in punk music at the time. And they were like, "Yes, we're not cool. Like that's what who we are. We're uncool nerds that um, are creating this space." And it was a it was a safe space to collaborate in. Um, it has influenced, you know, thousands of artists and thousands of sh uh, spaces like that um, throughout the country, around the world, um, and it was it was uh, hugely inspirational to me at, at when I was when I was um, growing up. Right. That's uh, yeah, you just hit. A, I, he said we're not cool, and that just made me excited because I've been um, <laughs> I've been thinking about you know the, as soon as something becomes cool, it becomes very easily marketable. And as soon as it becomes very easily marketable, you see things like that happen to punk, where punk was actually, as far as my limited understanding of something that happened before I was really born, uh, was a uh, uh, that kind of it's a com it's a response to not wanting to wait anymore for services you think you 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 should you deserve so you're making a bunch of music and there's nowhere for it to go because the industry controls the entire system and it doesn't have your it doesn't have you in mind 
And uh, so th that's where these communities that form really matter because they just formed their own strength and started publishing their own work and started representing their own values and became um, a pretty fastly fast growing uh, alternative to this otherwise like uh, pretty unchallenged, I guess, of the uh, industry, and I feel like we're kind of in that similar spot where, um, in video games, I, I don't know the statistics for ownership, and I don't know the statistics for independent games versus, um, you know, the big publishers. But if you you know if you look at music, which where we think we have an independent scene and punk and whatever, uh, it's three publishers uh, owning like ninety percent of everything that happens, or eighty eight percent, which is still a lot. You know, that's like that's where we that's a that's a rosy world. That's a rosy world compared to games. So we're having these games. This games industry is gonna is gonna boom. It's gonna be the biggest thing. It's like f music has come down. I think film is not is gonna is coming down, and games is going uh, like enormously. It's, it's expanding enormously uh, year by year. So you're gonna get this world of like everyone's gonna be touched by games, and they're gonna be touched by what the game industry is and who represents themselves in, their, in those values. So I feel like taking some of that uh, independence to heart and, and trying to bring more uh, cultural ownership of, that, of this medium is, 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 the, is the step we all have to take. And I think exhibitions fit into, is our one tactic, but there's so many, but the exhibitions are a tactic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's the thing that, that, that I always responded to about you guys is, is, is sort of kind of borrowing this, um, this mode of of kind of not doing business, you know, like le, le, like community building and stuff like that from um, from this other medium from from music, and and I th that's why I've always been really curious about um, your own personal uh, histories there, the, the, the stuff that you were exposed to when when you were younger, the stuff that, that kind of where did you learn those lessons, where did you kind of um, form those habits or, or, or those instincts for for what community is supposed to look like, you know, because I I think that that video games being a relatively New medium being a medium that was always associated with technological progress and and you know commercial aims, I think didn't necessarily naturally have a lot of that that stuff yet, and 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 and, and has had to have it brought to it, and and um, and continues to. And I think that you guys are are sort of like among the, the the leading examples of people who are kind of like really explicitly trying to bring some of those those values over, and that's the thing that I've, I've always responded to. I mean, wh wh what was what was I, I mean, said you were kind of. Into, into punk rock and stuff in the in the 90s. Um, I, I went to a few shows at ABC No Rio, and and uh, one of them was probably pretty Coney Island em High. embarrassing. <laughs> Coney Island High. Um, <laughs> what, what were I mean musically? Was that an important influence to you? Is that a thing that you kind of that that, that changed you, that moved you, or, or or do you not necessarily take it from there? It's not from there, but it's not that it's from anywhere. I feel like it's just missing from games. There's so many. I mean, it's not even missing from games. It's here in games, but it's. Uh, Underrepresented or something, but there there are so many parts of uh, the world, not only just media, uh, where you can see the value of people getting together and making conversation with each other regularly, and then starting to form this voice, and then and then they're starting to take ownership of the problems that they see around them and, and actually matter, and uh, and you know bringing that into games is sort of makes sense, especially as you uh especially as it's becoming a dominant part of what our you know what our media is and how what we can what we are as people and as a society games is a big part of it and and it, we have to take over some of that and we have to take over most of it um as people and uh i don't think that's coming from i mean I, i've it is inherent to a lot of music and i've run music spaces probably since i was young like organized things like silent barn in different you know, in different cities before, and, and even at college, and you know, it's it is an ingrained part of music, but I feel like it's an ingrained part of lots of activism, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so so let's talk a little bit about about, about spaces and, and and the various spaces that the kind of Baby Castles has has interacted with. So so um, you guys met met at school. Um, you you were in a program that was like kind of really very specifically about DIY in a way, right? Like, like ITP is about getting, getting your hands dirty with stuff and building it and, and making it yourself, right? Uh, maybe. No comment. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's supposed to be. Okay. Um, yeah, it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why, that's why I enrolled. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. what I thought. But, but, but so, so, so you, guys, you guys met, you were already running Silent Barn, or, or, or you, were, you were living there, or, or how, 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 did this, oh, yeah. how did that thing happen? No. No, remember that guy? Oh, yeah, this is a good out. story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I don't remember all of it, but... Uh, Greg Treffrey. 
Uh, do you guys know Greg? Come out and Trevor Fry. Sorry, come out and play. Was also uh, our teacher, and it was uh, in a game called in a, in a class called alternative re- alternative reality games, and that's it. And we were just making them. And uh, Syed was our te- uh, my team's test subject. Where uh, little did I know there was some actual related trouble um, that mimicked <laughs> the scene that we made for him. But we just handed a. Uh, I didn't pay my uh, tuition, and I thought I was getting kicked out of school, and uh, I was doing badly at the time. Oh, you you were you were like. Around, <laughs> I, was, I, was around. <laughs> I was around, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so like a letter came, and it kind of modeled that. And we'll, I'll keep you. Uh, yeah, that was a, a rabbit hole. Was a briefcase that had a really <laughs> um, uh, important letter about school tuition and stuff like that. For so <laughs> it worked, it worked a little too well, and then that's how we got to know each other. Um, right, and that's and where we met Nick as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So game academics, basically. Sure. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, but but so, so so you started. You put on your. When did you put on your first event? <laughs> uh, it was November. There was a secret one that was yeah. a November one uh, in November that um, two thousand nine. In two thousand nine, but the the actual event that happened with Baby Castle's name was after this festival called Blit Festival, which uh, a lot of our friends were going to at the time because um, it was it was like a chip music, a place, and we became like sort of the after party for that festival. And um, and I believe that was in two th- in January two thousand and ten or December of two uh, thousand and nine. Mm-hmm. For a while, like Baby Castles was just kind of we thought our mission was to just throw games at the public at like <laughs> totally random places. So, I I mean before even Baby before it was called Baby Castles. Um, in college, in like two, in the early two thousands, I was trying to do game exhibitions of student works in these art parties, which would go okay. Um, we'd mostly get the controllers broken and stuff like that because we didn't know what we were doing. Um, that was actually a big deal. And then, uh, you know, then uh, I just tried showing Charles Barkley "Shut Up and Jam" Gaiden at a record label um, release party where nobody played the game and they just hung around and talked about how much they hated basketball and Charles Barkley. And threw you out <laughs> that night, right? I, I don't remember. Yeah, they did. <laughs> um, and uh, ironically, that, that space is Death by Audio. No, that right. was different. That oh, was that different, was a different That one. was a different place. But there was another Death by then Audio. Then there was a yeah. Death by Audio exhibition where it actually wasn't DIY enough where like they were confused about their infrastructure about participation where some of them was like do it and some of them were like get that out of here and they didn't really know how to agree on that stuff yet but figuring that out is important because Silent Barn did have that infrastructure and then this huge movement kind of showed up because and lots of them show up at Silent Barn. And the, the, the infrastructure you're talking about is, is the infrastructure of, of getting uh, people involved. Of letting of people, letting people yeah. um, be creative. Well right. it was also super gra- yeah like like we had Silent Barn but then we had you know, w- one night uh, it was like snowing, kind of like yeah, this, um, um, in two thousand and nine, uh, and we were supposed to go to uh, an event where we strapped these netbooks around our chests and and oh, and backpack. had people backpack. Uh, well, backpack, and I had one around my neck, uh-huh. um, and people would play games off of us while we were dancing. Fractal Fighter, if I remember, <laughs> and uh, and and tiny platypus, platyp- tiny platypus pimps. Is that what? It was yeah, called? yeah. Ivan Saffron made that. Yeah, it was a game. Oh, I don't know if he wants to. Yeah, oh, he sorry. probably doesn't. Sorry, want Ivan. Know, sorry, I'm sorry you made that. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so good. And and w- you know, and we would we would like we walked from Queens to downtown Brooklyn in three feet of snow to go to these events, and well, there was a party. There is still a party called Cheryl where we would make a game about my cat every month. They had a, a party, and we'd show up with the new game. Like we'd on take the like street outside, the street, running by the car. Yeah, and we'd like plug in to Canal's uh, uh, car with a AC to DC adapter that would blow all his fuses, and we would have games up for like a few <laughs> minutes, but it'd be like really fun for the few minutes for the people who were smoking outside. But it was like this idea of like really, you know, pushing games onto people, independent games onto people. Uh, around the city. So all those were dumb ideas. Those yeah. Were, yeah, 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 those were just, it's, it's, we, it's, were, it's we were just having fun. But the cool thing was that, like, you know, th- those were dumb experiments, and then the actual successful thing to community building, getting agency, and getting people to take over the medium is to have a sustained, and this doesn't happen enough, um, but a sustained place for people to expect to be able to do that, like to show up and be part of games culture in New York. Uh, you, you need you need that space to actually def- be defined that way, and I think that really helped. And that's right. And, and, and so and so you had that space the first time at, at, at Silent Barn. That that, that yes. was that was where you that started running regular events. Yeah. 
It was a permanent. It, it was, was like open every night, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And 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 you would occasionally throw like like opening parties. Th- th- there'd be music involved, uh, almost always. Yeah. What, what? Sometimes it would just be like play night. <laughs> I don't right. know. It would be whatever. As long as you have an a uh, game exhibition space, we like uh, we, we like had a. You know, potlucks and uh, brunch shows and whatever right. we wanted to do. Well, I mean, I was wondering if you could kind of describe the space a little bit for people who who, who weren't there and, and won't get to go there. Toby Lurio can do that. Yeah, there's a there's a zine by Toby Lurio that describes it better than we could ever ever come close to describing right. it. It's on our uh, site somewhere. We'll, we'll post it. Yeah, today. we'll post it <laughs> on our Facebook right. and Twitter. Well, and, and I mean, so some of the pictures that, that, that continue to look oh, yeah. behind oh, us oh. Are, 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 are from that. It, it's, 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 it's just a mix of <laughs> yes. stuff. What is the yeah. screen? Sex game. Um, yeah, it, it's not in chronological order. You guys yeah. should look at the audience, not the screen. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess th- there's, there's a topic that I was interested in. I, I think maybe now is a, a, a time to kind of bring it up, which is, I was interested in, in the the sort of the the baby castles aesthetic. You know what I mean? I I think one of the things that kind of hit you when when you came in, especially to, to this space and, and especially to, to the one after that, um, was um, you know this kind of grimy sort of like handmade uh, kind of kind of thing. You know, uh, arcade cabinets that were being held together with with duct tape, often literally controllers that were half broken, um, rough surfaces and stuff that was all very handmade. And stuff, and I, I guess I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, the, the the way that that sprang either from or both from or you know all of the above, um, the material constraints in terms of what you had available as far as resources or labor, but also kind of what you were saying and 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 putting out there with that that, that, that this was a space that was made by people is is the thing that always struck me that that that, that this it was this kind of like lovingly junky kind of kind of feel that you got that was at the same time very human. Okay. Well, one, one thing we were really proud of, the first, I mean, we have these two parallel missions that we have to kind of figure out and, and actually just co-pursue at the same time. But the, the n- we didn't always have two missions. Um, first, there, wasn't, there weren't really later career game designers in the same um, prevalence as they are now, and we want to work for them as, we, as much as we want to work for entry-level participants uh, making games. And uh, for, so the first f- maybe two, three years, we were really proud of our budgets, which were very, very small. And, and, the, and like the first year, we did a whole year of exhibitions for 650 bucks. And we used to joke, but it's true, that $400 uh, was spent on a neon sign. And the other money was probably on speakers and controllers after, as they broke. And we used... Sidewinders. And, and, well... Yeah. <laughs> Kickstarter, for that. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, the whole the whole point we were trying to, f- like we were proclaiming for a few years was uh, we have to all do this. There's no reason not to do this. Here's some software to help put up games. Here's like uh, like a pretty cost effective hardware, and you can usually get it donated because you can run most of the work at the time on on like early 2000 boxes, which was crazy, but you could, and so uh, so we did, and that was part of. Um, so that was like a core principle was to keep presenting the fact that there's really no reason not to take this up and and figure it out and, and start doing yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, as, as we look at some of these images, I, I think that one of the, you know, there's a couple things going on here, right, that, that people kind of can take away from this or they're immediately struck with. I mean, I mean one is a bit of a sort of like jokey, cutesy, retro kind of like, hey, it's an arcade again. Like, but then I'm also struck by, by the idea that, like, by building arcade cabinets by hand, by, by, by filling them with games that you would never see in a corporate setting. It, there's, there's a really kind of deliberate, we're taking this back kind of thing going on there. That, that, that this thing that, that started out being a, a, a bit of kind of mass-produced corporate culture is actually a thing now that's being built by hand by people who are probably in this room right now, and you can too, is I was kind of impressed the way that, that was kind of expressed throughout, like organically, the entire experience, you know? Um, you, like, like, no one had to tell me that that's what you guys were doing. It was apparent just walking in there. Right. It was also a, cel- in a uh, celebration of uh, arcades, right? Right, 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 yeah, yeah, that's, like, yeah that's a really good point. Uh, at the time, um, there was the Chinatown Arcade, but that was the only arcade that was available, you know? And most arcades around uh, Times Square in New York City had closed down, and so it was a lot of a lot of our, of course, a lot of our aesthetic c- comes from uh, DIY and and just working with our, within our means, but also like, you know, it was these warped 
celebrate. Yeah, tr- 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 trying to trying to relocate that kind yeah. of yeah, p- p- pull that in from from your from your childhood. That obviously, you have, must have had formative experiences at, at, at arcades and stuff. It's worth taking into account that most of the people that would make cabinets were usually street artists in yeah. um, um, because we worked at the time in collaboration with this group, Show Paper, which would really promote the value uh, a lot of street artists and kind of bring them into other culture. And we would do that. We would work with the same artists and they were like ready to contribute work to anything really. Right. So that was part of it. Um, and that has its own ethos that was kind of probably somehow evident in that work. At the same time, um, uh, the whole sis- the whole kind of thesis of baby castles to me right now is that exhibitions are a really valuable tactic um, in, in getting more culture getting us to own get, getting any ev- people to own what games are and so there's a, there's a lot of pieces of that like uh if you look at like what the industry is and how much of it is is not giant publisher owned uh we're trying to like build that number and uh, there's a lot of pieces of that and th- like one of the obvious ones is game making and i think that there's um good work being done in getting a diversity of people in different contexts uh, for making games uh, a lot of that is in the software that people, uh, there's so much software to help people make games. And a lot of that is in the education programs that have been taking off in recent years um, and many in New York. Um, and I think that game writing is, uh, uh, like there's a lot more independent work. As, as if I haven't been to it, the zine library that we have here and I'm really excited to check it out right after this. But um, I do feel like there's, there's a few places that people have taken things into their own hands and continue to. Um, but the big question uh, to to me in 2009 and and persists now is the distribution of this work and like who plays the promotion like the the entry points into culture, and first, you know people have always lots of people have always been making video games. Um, for ver- like more and more kinds of people are making them now, and hope hopefully that'll improve and continue to improve. And I think people see the imperative there. Um, but who controlled? Who owned the uh, the like entry points into the people, like who who owned the distribution, basically. First, it was giant corporate publishers entirely. At some point, it became advertise advertisers and and uh, whatever you want to call things like Adult Swim. Um, and then at some point, it became iTunes and Steam and Xbox Live and I don't remember the other one, uh, PSN. Uh, um, I couldn't remember. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but the point is that the, while these are all relatively better and the and everything's like there's a little bit more freedom in each step. There, the whole system is owned, the, all of that is owned by a very small set of, you know, uh, giant companies and be- behemoths. And, uh, and that's gonna reflect a very small set of values, like the big bottleneck. It do, it, like it has value and it doesn't have value, but we have to recognize that there's, that's a big bottleneck to what video games are and how they're distributed into culture. Um, that, that distribution is a, is a problem. Um, and so there's probably lots of answers to that, and there were for a while. Like people used to trade. Like there's more internet game sites for independent games and stuff were like better in the '90s, and people paid attention. They're they're probably around now too. There's a lot of lot of different like there's festivals like this, but um, but exhibitions I think are interesting for the reasons that I was trying to bring up with what the aesthetic was, which was that. Exhibitions actually are pretty, like exhibition spaces there are something that lots of people can make, like many per city or something like that. And so there's so much capacity for a diversity and ownership of that entry point into culture. And so that, that means there's more kinds of work that'll show up in those places and like be celebrated. There's more kinds of communities that will build. Uh, and especially if they're like DIY exhibition spaces, uh, that means that each space has like a potential like huge inhabitation of values like uh, inha- I don't know what the word is for that but like just more values show up in video games that way um and so that's our angle with the DIY exhibition spaces but we're also trying to figure out how to extend that um and so the le- uh, and like be a good environment make the exhibition space make sense to uh, later career artists that that actually need a different form of support you know, I mean, hearing you describe that, it seems like there's kind of like a very literal implementation of of think local, act global. I mean, think global, act local, kind of in in, in your thing, right? Like you, you start out, you're talking about all of these things that are subject to, you know, market forces and 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 corporate decisions and and platform holders and all these things, and you're saying that a way to disrupt that is start showing the games that you want to show in your garage and invite some people over, and and that that that, that that's not that's not a way that people kind of in this kind of like 21st century late capitalism kind of setting, think about disruption, right? Like, like th- think about how do we reshape an industry? You're saying 
do it over here, do it in your neighborhood. And, and I, I, I think that's, that's a really fresh take on it, especially in, you know, in the world of video games. Or in your oven, if, we, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I, I mean, it, it, as we're, we're kind of roughly, you know, we're, we're, we're weaving in and out of, of, of your sort of, of your history and, and, and the arc of what you guys have, have been up to since, um, since you started, uh, you know, four and a half or five years ago. Um, I think an, another, another thing that I was interested in, in talking about is, you know, you, you, you are so, you espouse so much of, of this kind of DIY um, ethic and, and uh, so much of, of your, your history and your DNA is, is about that, is, is about these kind of like, these spaces where, where, where people can come in and, and, and just grab what they want and, and, and start participating tomorrow, come back again tomorrow and, and, and curate one of these things. That woven through your history has, has, has been the slightly surprising thing of, of you working with these kind of like these big cultural institutions at the same time. That's the, that's the thing that started happening a, you know, a, a couple of years into when you guys got together. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and some of the contrasts, what you took out of that and, and, and maybe where, where that's begun to take you. Sure. Um. <clears throat> I guess uh, our, one, of, one of our first really big collaborations was at the Museum of Natural History, um, uh, where Baby Castles, Ivan Safran, Greg Fox, Stephen Merritt uh, created a game <laughs> for a planetarium, for the Hayden Planetarium. It was a multiplayer game, kind of like, I guess like Space Team, before Space Team. Um, where um, you had controllers all over this, uh, the center of this, uh, uh, of the planetarium, and uh, five people were were flying a ship, and um, and you were trying to get to uh, the end of the universe, and you would warp to another part of the universe. And that collaboration happened because I was at Games for Change, and they they made sure that we were all. Uh, that I was on a panel with um, people from the New York Public Library and Museum of Natural History, and um, and this person invited us to to do it, and um, and it was it was it was really interesting because um, it was the first time in our in our history where we threw an event that wasn't all ages, um, which was you know, which like we fought over yeah we, we we fought over we also it was incredibly expensive it was like 75 dollars, so it's not accessible financially as well so those are two things mm -hmm. that you know that were strikes and suddenly this. sponsored by lockheed martin yeah at the, that at was the, the worst <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was as, so as, bad as, as strikes go yeah that's a yeah yeah that was that 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 sucked um and we were panicking but in retrospect when we finally, d we didn't even have time to actually even, you know, we were going, we, we thought about pulling out, but we ended up doing this because it was just, everyone was so excited and proud of, of, of this event. And so in retrospect, we, we realized in, in, you know, uh, one of, when we were d developing our mission statement, one of our key, uh, one of our key requirements as like, you know, uh, healthy baby castles is, <laughs> is, is to uh, expand games to the general uh, public, expand independent games to the general public, um, uh, with the intent that the when more people you know experience these types of games, and um, and are inspired by them, that they in turn make games as well, and di diversifying this pool of of game developers that we have, you know, and diversifying this this uh, this this pool of voices in games. Right. Th th that it sounds like there's there's potential downsides compared to, to, to what your values were up to that point in, in interacting with this this big institution that has its requirements or, or or its values and stuff like that. But but then there's there's the the trade off of exposing what you're what you're about to this audience that would never come to Silent Barn, that that, that, that would never have heard of it, that would never show up at Showpaper. Um, and, and, and you're saying that, that that's, a, that's a big thing that you kind of decided to value itself. Well, there's a, comp that was, there's a lot of compromises that were made um, in between not being able to own our own space. So we did like a year and a half or maybe even longer of exhibitions in these large cultural institutions. Um, you know, uh, can't, uh, what's the name? La Guetaire Lyrique was yeah. my favorite. Um, mm -hmm. But Where, where, where you, you built a thing called Meowtown? Meowtown. Uh, Meowtown. A whole Meowton. town. There's a miss spelling of my cat's name. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's the correct way to spell your cat's name? Uh, my Meowtron. 
I don't think it was a typo when we were figuring out what to do. <laughs> but um, it turned out, the typo turned out to be like this, uh, I mean, it had a budget, though. The budget was like 15000 yeah. or something. Very different from six fifty for a year. Okay. Um, and uh, and the, and then it turned into this 2,500 square foot cat village town thing with complete with like cat night and day lighting. And, and, and like cats live shorter. So. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and it was a... Maybe it was not so accurate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> had a town hall and a cemetery. A lot of people here probably made this in Paris with us. Um, and uh, uh, and it, you know, it embedded in the like Miaoma, which was the uh, art museum inside Miao Tin. Uh, <laughs> there, there was like a, a you, you like explore the, this village long enough, and you'll find like a curation of five or six games about um, independent games made by uh, some some of them pretty. Uh, like well known and some of them entry level game designers about their cats, um, so that was it was just like uh, that was our exhibition there. But um, right. the 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 thing that the basic that actually wasn't a compromise. We got like the all ages and the twenty thousand or so people coming to visit and the budget and all that. But what over time basically we did these things that had a lot more people coming and a lot more money. Uh, facilitating the exhibition and that act that turn you know that you were like why do you do what you do in this way and well, right. that was one mission but we've also started working on this like a gallery-esque mission where we're producing actually pretty or helping I guess producing we end up producing it but also showcasing ideally in the future um, some high quality installation um, work uh, in independent video game exhibitions uh, and so that's we're trying to pursue the parallel paths in their next space and and do uh, and support. I mean, be able to provide some level of higher level support to the artists that um, that work in in that context with a really beautiful like physical installation of independent video games, and then provide also the whole infrastructure for uh, fluid DIY. Just get your hands in, make an exhibition of the people that you care about. Use this space to f to figure it out for somewhere else, or do it here. Or have like host all kinds of events. So we're trying to do the entry level work, but we're also trying to explore how to support exhibitions like the ones we've done in the last year with budgets and and lots of traffic uh, on our own terms back again. Um, and that's actually where the whole Baby Castles Gallery we're building uh, comes from is is to bring it back to New York in a single space and and try to showcase both of those energies that we've picked up right and, and so, so that's that's the thing that that's that's hopefully coming up is is, is you guys going back to having a permanent space yeah, yeah. so yeah I, I, I mean like let's so yeah I, I I was I was really fascinated by this this kind of meandering kind of path and and, and how it's changed you how it's, how it's affected you and, and the choices you've, you've made along the way that that, that and it, it does seem like like it was partly this external factor of being so closely associated with having a space, so much of your mission around having this th this place to, to keep running these events, um, that once that went away, you guys didn't just stop. You guys continued on in a different context and kind of responded to that, brought the brought the values and the goals you had to that and kind of adapted, and now and now you're going forward. So I, I mean, maybe you could talk more about like what 2014 looks like for, for Baby Castles, what you expect to do oh going forward. I g it's too good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say the word. I like. I literally don't know how to pronounce it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pronunciation. Uh, one, not, one of <laughs> our first <laughs> exhibition is going to be Assalamu Alaikum Baby Castles uh, on May twenty seventh. Um, we're locking down a space for that right now, um, and a curator um, who may or may not be here, and uh, uh, some artists to build out an Islamic games uh, environment, um, and uh, some really good stuff lined up this year. And the whole point is. Um, is to explore both things, like to bring that space back, but also bring this um, support for, I mean the whole, the, the exhibitions that you do, DIY context, they, they matter. All of this is kind of a little bit about both the different forms of reward. It's, there's a community building we talked about already, the reward for the artists. And the DIY context is very easy. Uh, in fact, you need a little less money to reinforce participation by entry-level artists. It's, it doesn't have to be about money. It doesn't have to compete with iTunes or mass market sales or anything. It just has to make you feel good about what you're doing so you'll do it more. And uh, and you know all of us can facilitate that by building exhibition spaces for games in our ovens. Um, but um, there's also, we have to see where we can carry that through to some of the later, the, the some of the artists that are started out working with us Years ago, and are just huge deals now in, in 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 whatever digital like they're they're doing well they're doing well and um we want to 
make something meaningful for them to participate back in local exhibition culture and have people come out to celebrate their work as artists. And we want to allow them to have that independence. I've seen at least one talk in recent times by a really good friend of mine where I saw the person on stage say, hey, I'm not a student anymore. I can't do that work. I have to focus on mass market games. You students are the only chance we have for independent work. Um, you got to do it. You got to make this really exciting physical exhibition stuff um, because no one else can do it. That sounds like uh, not the not a visionary future if we let it be that way. We have to we have to support people like that and and their careers afterwards. And so we're trying out the gallery environment as well. And we're trying to we're working with we're doing an armory show uh, exhibition, a New York armory show exhibition in a, in a week or two. Um, on March 6th, it opens at Ace Hotel, and we're starting to work with other gallery partners. I've been trying to slowly meet collectors that are interested in this stuff, and and that could help, you know? That could help down the road. Even if it's a while from now, it's gonna start happening, and we're gonna be able to, uh, and I think the end result is that these artists that make games can continue to view their work in a personal trajectory, um, and, like all the way, like their whole career, which is really cool. Right, so you, you, you're talking about starting, tr trying to kind of, find sustainability for the kind of work that you started seeing occur at, 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 at these events that you were throwing um, and, and try to allow people to keep making it beyond just when, oh yeah, I, I, I can afford to do this now because I don't have any of the constraints of, of massive debt or a family to support or any of this, this other stuff or I can do this without you know, uh, turning down some, some, some big contract that's, that's gonna keep supporting me. So, so, so you're exploring other ways Basically, of, of funding this kind of work. I mean, do, do you have any of what that looks like yet? It, is 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 it, is it about an art gallery kind of model? A, about like kind of like more about fine art, like getting people to to purchase these works or or, or getting commissions for stuff. Like, what's what 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 does the the format of that actually look like? Do you want to talk about it? Or? Com commissions where we've already kind of explored that model because that's what we did the last year and a half and we'll continue to do that and that does provide some amount of money to artists that participate in those because sometimes the budgets are high enough and that's uh we're about to do a special <laughs> commission in in april maybe um and, uh, and uh you know and get to support some great artists that way um and but you know, we don't know what we're doing. We didn't come from the <laughs> we didn't come from the art world. We don't when we project our operations, we don't include any of this in it. We include everything that it takes to survive as a space, uh, and that's what we're basing our you know our reality on. However, that space is going to allow lots of people to experiment, including us, who um, <coughs> are like you know responsible for figuring it out. And one of the experiments we're having, uh, we're we're going to put into place, is exactly what we've done uh, pretty well. The, in, the com in the commissions environment, which is create these environments that are very celebrated on their own terms. Um, in like just, uh, oh man, I, I, I actually don't want to get into it too much. Uh, that's, I, I've decided I don't want to get into it too much, but we are talking about uh, collectors. I'm trying to cool. talk about collectors. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I guess uh, like the context has always been, um, you know, uh, first supporting um, emerging independent contemporary video game developers and now um just reiterating what Kanal is saying now all of our friends are are at this point in their career where you know uh things have to become sustainable or they can't continue to do their work um the things have to be sustainable for us as well and which is also an interesting like yeah th th this point. this has not been a full-time job for you guys financially ever Right? No. It yeah. was almost entirely volunteer right yeah. so yeah. far, but we all k we keep saying, "Hey, soon." Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll pay. We'll pay. Yeah, yeah and I, I mean, it's. I, I I find that a fascinating topic because I I think it's I think it's true throughout indie games in, in so many different quarters that we so often talk about. We do talk about money a lot in games, right? But 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 it's it, it, it's often um, these massive successes and, and and this kind of stratospheric kind of cash, while on the on the inverse side of that you have these people who are just supporting their work through, through, through maintaining other day jobs doing the stuff in the corners or like you're saying doing interesting independent work until they have to finally grow up and then go get a real job and 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 I, I feel like that's true of, of the artists that you're trying to support and, and, and it's true of you guys also it, it's, it's trying to find a, a sustainable way through 
and, and, and keep this stuff going that, 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 that often art and commerce are, are, are so opposed and the idea of kind of pursuing uh, sustainable business models and stuff like that sounds like a gross thing. But it's also, it's a crucial, if, if you believe this stuff, if you believe in this stuff and you want to see it continue, then it is a thing you have to take seriously at some point, right? It's not the, it's not gross. It's the, there's a part of it that's gross and we're trying to, um, I mean, th that's why we're so interested in exhibitions because it's like the closest to commu direct community support models that you can make. Um, now we can do that pretty easily for entry level uh, game designers by just get, you know, any money, either like donations or if you want door tickets or some percentage of a bar or what you know anything works but and and we've we tried them all out basically with with in all three of our la all of our spaces or commissions we try out some random model for splitting revenue with the 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 game designers involved and sometimes it's like 30 bucks and sometimes it's a few thousand but it doesn't at the time it didn't matter yeah. um um but what's exciting at the time is that it's direct support um from people that like like the work and are excited about it, trying to see that through is the the experiment. You know, like uh, the important thing is to try to get. Uh, it's back about the values and the ownership of the culture. The more we can get people, individuals, and just basically not behemoth corporations, which uh, have their own place, but the more we can move the um, ownership of like what's supported, and uh, that's basically it. Um, to humans, to to a people level culture, the better. So the gallery does allow us to at least explore. It's not perfect, but it does allow us to, uh, if we d if we do things right. And we're actually in conversations about this because we actually don't know what we're doing. So I've been having as many conversations as possible with how to approach this. And over time, it's starting to seem more and more possible. It might take a while, but it might not. Um, but we we do want to figure out how to how to how to build these exhibitions with pieces that do make sense to collectors, uh, at least on individual pieces, um, and that'll do a lot. And there's signs. There's like MoMA is collecting games now permanently, right? Right. Right. So there's certainly signs towards this, and it doesn't seem like it's a complete shot in the dark. And more and more people just collect uh, the new the whole new media thing that's been happening the past, like it wasn't happening, and then suddenly it actually is, and people are actually are collecting it, and. One of the big, you know, I, I don't, it's almost like an imperative to, if we're gonna take this exhibition stuff ser seriously, we have to try the whole circle. We have to try s seeing how far it supports everyone. We do find our pl ourselves in a place where we're the most well positioned to be able to try to make this loop, like, so we're gonna, we're gonna have to try. And, and, and then we'll see in the next year or two how that actually goes. Cool. I was do you guys wanna take some questions? A few minutes for questions. Sure. Yeah? Does anyone want to yeah. ask a question? Um, so uh, the Armory Show is, um, it's actually at the Ace Hotel. Um, it's, um, it's a curation of Chinese art games um, and from mainland China. Um, and it's pretty interesting. It's uh, by a curator uh, named Brian Ma. Um, our our whole uh, our whole um, idea around the curation was that it it's an investigation of uh, independent games in mainland China and why they're so hard to come by. Um, so. Um, so that's basically been that's that's our story and our narrative. We're going. We found some emerging independent game artists, and then we found people who've been making really interesting clones, or at least, you know, clones defined by Western standards, right? Um, so kind of uh, kind of hinting at the the whole Flappy Bird uh, discussion as well. Um, so so yeah, and we we will have uh, about four to six games in the Ace Hotel Gallery installed for about a month um, starting March 6th. The thing about that is they just told us what, you know, the Armory was yeah. like, here we want Chinese independent games and they have to be from mainland China. And then we find a curator and he's been working really hard. Yeah, uh, And he's really turned into this crazy personal narrative, which is actually getting more interesting um, because it's like an internal debate um, playing out in these games that are gonna be up. But it is, what's exciting about that, it, it just on a large perspective, it's just like it's gonna be up 24 hours uh, a day, f like, for a whole month at this hotel, which is where all, a lot of the organizers of the Armory Show uh, come in. You know, like it's just going to be a vivid face, just like partnering with any other 
like a mass institution, but this one's straight up in the in the art um, producers and collectors and supporters world. And so we can we can have that conversation right there for like a whole month straight, and which will really inform the next you know years of the project. Anybody else questions? Um, like, I mean, because uh, everybody doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. Some people don't make games because they're trying to make a point or something. A lot of people make it just because they're trying to sell. So maybe people just make their games and like they, they don't see it the same way. Well, you know, what's interesting about, if, well, if you think about like, uh, independent games in the 80s, right? If you think about games in the 80s when there was a programmer, um, uh, and maybe another artist, but it was usually the programmer and the artist and the musician was one guy or one lady. And um, and what was so cool is that the, the, the imprint of that person was in that game, right? You could kind of, you know, you could, you could see the designer in the game and the games that they made. Regardless of, of, of you know, of, the content of the game, if the, you know, they they weren't necessarily, you know, Centipede wasn't necessarily talking about anyone, but you could definitely get a vibe of of the designers in 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 that game, and that's what's so interesting about these games is they're made by people. They're not made by corporations. They're not made by, you know, like uh, cogs at EA. Um, that's that's how I. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that's what I'm excited about. But then, like, Anna Anthropy has this uh, book, this really awesome book about, uh, you know, video game zinesters and, like, how, you know, when you add more voices into, w when, you, when you have, like, I, I remember um, this one game that was really popular about last year or a year ago was Ponycorn, right? It was, like, this, like, little girl, an eight-year-old girl made a game with her father about a pony corn and it was it just like took off every and it was for a game jam and and like you know having voices from um, from eight year old kids to to you know people of all identities and genders and races just just makes more just makes uh, the space of games more diverse and more interesting at least you know to me personally that's the part I was interested in it wasn't necessarily more participation um, I mean of course. But it's more diversity and values in the medium. Um, and some of that's from making games, not all of it, but that's a big part of it. Um, for example, for this uh, current secret that might happen in April, uh, we'll have to put a curation together. I think a game is made in just other, <coughs> in just the boroughs of New York from different um, people that grew up in the other boroughs of New York. and. It's not actually going to be that much work. It's going to be all like high school uh, program work, and and a few. We're going to find a few. It's going to be a search, and that shouldn't be the case. I mean, like I can do that for uh, for 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 lots of other mediums. I can I can find uh, make makers of the work. I can I can do that. Um, and it's not. It's I can expect a little bit of an investigation for games right now. So that it is going to be exciting to get past that and have it expected that all kinds of people are contributing to to games, because that's the overall problem with the, the industry and the medium is that it's a very, currently it reflects, even taking into account all of our participation in independent games, it currently reflects a very narrow set of values and and you know the dream is to change that. I mean, th this is the thing that, that, that we were talking about right before we came over here, right, is, is that I think that one of the things that's, that's striking to me about about you guys and, and what you, how you've approached all this and what you bring to it is is that you guys aren't saying, hey, we're into in, 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 in in indie games because it's an amazing new market opportunity. You, you, you haven't, you're not coming at this from, from that perspective. You're coming at it, it's an article of faith for you guys that a medium, that culture ought to be owned by people. That the more of that, the better, period, almost, is, 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 is what I'm feeling from you guys. And um, yeah, I, I feel like that's kind of how I, how I would respond to, to, to that question is, 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 is why this, and it's, it's because it's better than not. <laughs>
that's the guy. I didn't realize there was an open to. question until you until you you brought it up that that's actually that's that's a point of faith. So it is. Yeah, yeah. I I think we're out of time, guys. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.